God used to dwell in a house among his people. But now he has a home that's better than the first. It doesn't look like a building with a steeple. Now he's living in the people of the church. Brick after brick, God is building his temple. Brick after brick, he's making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his people as the stones, he is building a place he can live. Brick after brick. Good morning, folks. So, we're going to be talking about the fatherhood of God today. Uh, God is indeed our father, our provider, and our all. Beginning of Deuteronomy, the first three chapters actually gets devoted to Moses kind of recounting for the people a lot of the significant events that had happened. And it takes like three chapters before he gets to the point where he finally says, and now, here's what we're going to do. So he didn't miss any details here. Here's what we have, starting off with verses 20 and 21 in chapter 1. He says, And I said to you at the time, you have come to the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. Great, we're going to go to the promised land. See, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up, take possession as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has told you. Do not fear or be dismayed. The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight for you, just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes, and in the wilderness, we have seen how the Lord carried you as a man carries his son all the way that you went until you came to this place. So we see verse 30 and 31, and that's where our lesson is coming from. The whole idea, you heard it in uh, one of the songs today about the fatherhood of God, and how the holy God carries us as a man carries his son. So what does that mean exactly? We get the idea of the father-son relationship. Well, he certainly cares for him. He's concerned about what happens to him every day. He's always got his eye on him. Watching out for my boy. He loves him. God loves us. We're his children. No matter how many stupid things we do, he still loves us. No matter how many times we don't listen, he still loves us. The father tries to do everything he can to protect his son. I believe that we don't realize how much God really does protect us on a daily basis. That shield is always there. That the most important thing we get protected from when we put ourselves in God's hand is condemnation. No matter how hard the devil might try, we're always going to be protected from that. Guidance. A child needs guidance because there's an endless amount of mistakes you make as you're going along and learning. We need guidance as adults too, right? We're always tripping over our own feet. We need to be taught. We need to be taught what's right and what's wrong. We need to be taught how to decide what looks right and looks wrong to us. It's one of the things you teach a child. Pretty big job being a parent. I'm having enough trouble with a puppy right now. Admonishing him. The kid's got to know when he's doing the wrong thing. There's got to be a certain amount of correction. No, you can't do that. You have to stop doing that. We need that too. And most of all, we need to be encouraged. It's okay. I know you're hurt. I know you feel bad. I know you, you regret doing it again. But I'm going to guide you along. I'm going to build you up. You can take your encouragement from me. We're all familiar with Psalm 23. We're most familiar with it in the context of funerals. It's used all the time in funeral services. And I never really gave it that much as much as I've always loved Psalm 23, and I've understood the general concepts, for some reason, I never really focused on it this way, where we talk about the specifics of fatherhood and the fatherhood of God. And you see all those things I just mentioned in Psalm 23. Your shepherd guides you along, provides for what you need, restores you, keeps you going, tries to guide you from making mistakes. All right, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. This is 
a father's role. When I read this, even though it's an Old Testament thing, my mind always goes to Jesus because we talk about Jesus as the good shepherd. And you almost lose sight of the fatherhood concept here. So I want to really make sure you see how that's tied in. It says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. There's protection here. And there's what? There's admonishment too. And again, the provision. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. There's always something to be thankful for and to be joyful about. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Why? Because God loves me no matter what. I was thinking about Joseph. We spend a very limited amount of time thinking about Joseph, where we know all about how, okay, he gets spoken to by an angel, finds out that Mary's son's going to be the Messiah, don't worry about it, everything's fine, and we kind of leave it there. We don't think very much about him and the fatherhood role, which I think had to be pretty confusing for Joseph. I'm sure he spent a lot of time scratching his head when he first got the word of what was going to happen. Wait, what? We're going to do what? I can't get my head around this. <laughs> and as we see in the scriptures later on, his, you know, the, he didn't have his head around it. He just did the best he could with what he had. He must have wondered, well, how am I supposed to be basically an adoptive father to this child? How do I play that role? What does he need from me? Am I going to get any kind of special instructions on how to do this? Or do I just have to suss it out as I go along? But I'm sure he said, well, whatever, I'm going to have to trust God and do what I can do. But I think this must have been a pretty confusing time for Joseph. And, and uh, he's always been sort of a background figure. We don't hear that much about it. It'd be interesting to be able to go back and find out what was it like for this guy over the years trying to bring up the Messiah. Did he feel like he was even entitled to do anything? He was, I don't know, am I supposed to just sit here and, you know, let things miraculously happen? Am I supposed to be teaching him anything? What am I supposed to do? It must have been a very confusing time. Now, we have a couple of quotes from John here. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And again in John 6, so the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? So here's that thing, right? Everyone sees him as, well, this is Joseph's son, as far as we know. Got to be. Jesus, the son of Joseph. Yeah, we know. His, his mom and dad, we see him with them all the time. But Joseph knew that it wasn't quite that simple. We've talked about this before, the incident where Mary and Joseph were looking for Jesus, couldn't find him using the temple teaching. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why are you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? So he's not asking, why are you concerned about me? He's asking, why wouldn't you know to look here? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. No, they didn't get it. I can't blame them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. Their natural reaction here as people is, what's wrong with this kid? Why would he do that? He should know better. He says, well, didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? Obviously not, because they didn't understand what he was talking about. They didn't get it. This must have been one heck of a confusing time for both of them trying to bring up Jesus, trying to even figure out what that would mean. But he knew the difference. He went down with them, came to Nazareth, and was submissive to them. Jesus certainly wasn't confused about what needed to be done. These are the first recorded words of Jesus, interestingly enough, that, that we know of. The only documented incident from his childhood. And the last mention of Joseph in the Bible. You see him and you don't hear much about him after that. But this was not an example of disobedience. In fact, it was just the opposite. Jesus understood the priorities. He had a job to do in his father's house. Someone once told me, or asked me uh, at work. They said, well... 
what about this whole deal with Jesus and, and Joseph and everything? Do you think he might have ever said, hey, you can't tell me what to do. You're not my father. It's kind of an interesting question. I'll give you a second to think. Do you think that's possible? Well, the answer is no, because that would be disobedience, and Jesus would, wouldn't sin, and disobedience is sin. So it's not a matter of him not paying attention to what they wanted. It's just a matter of priorities and misunderstanding. They didn't realize what needed to be done. He did. It was kind of a teachable moment for them, and they didn't get it. Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son, as was supposed, common knowledge, in other words, of Joseph. Luke 3. Matthew 1 says, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Every time we see this verse, what do we think about? Oh, Jesus is going to be the Messiah. Okay, but there's another point here, too. Being the son, as was supposed, Joseph. That's how everyone does it. They assume it's Joseph's son. But he's instructed here that you shall call his name Jesus. You shall call his name Jesus. It was the father's responsibility, generally, to name the child. So again, Joseph's doing one of these, my, my son, kind of. But one thing I'm quite sure of is that he loved Jesus. He loved Jesus, and he did the best he possibly could. I'm convinced of that. He knew there was quite a responsibility there, and he did what he could to follow God's instruction. And I'm sure it wasn't always easy for him. So the word father, we hear about the term Abba all the time. It's Greek of Aramaic origin. People often say, well, it's the equivalent of the English word daddy, but it really isn't, not quite. It's a similar kind of a thing in that it's an intimate, familial term, but our term daddy is a lot more kind of casual than that. This is a little more important term. I'll show you that now. In Mark 14, it says, Jesus says, and he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but you will. See, this was a title of honor. It was an important title. It connoted an intimate, familial relationship, but still a very highly respectful one. It was like, hey, hey, Pop, you know, not that kind of thing. In fact, it was not used by the Jews to address God because it would be considered too flippant, too inappropriate for prayer. Yet Jesus used it all the time. His use of that term in addressing God was a completely new thing. But gradually, it did become more accepted as a sacred, proper name for God among Greek-speaking Jews. So, God is our Father. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. It says in Romans, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And again in Galatians, and because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, for you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Don't ever let that be lost on you. What a big deal that is. Like the song said earlier, the holy God that wants to be our, declares himself our father. This is a quote from Professor Gerald Bray from the Church of England. I found this fascinating. It is to the father that we pray through the Son, and in the Spirit, because that is the pattern of our relationship to God that he's revealed to us. We pray to the Father because our Creator is also our Redeemer, and it is in that redeeming love that we know him. I'll sit down with you all day and talk theology and talk about Jesus, my favorite topic. One of the things that always fascinates me is the whole idea of, of Trinitarian Christianity, which is pretty difficult to get your head around. You sit there for hours trying to get the right description through language, but it just doesn't happen. You can't quite get it. But that's okay. What's more important is what Gerald Bray is saying right here. What do you do about it? What is God to you? How do you relate to your Holy Father? This is what's important to understand. We pray to the Father through the Son and in the Spirit. The pattern of our relationship to God, that's what he's talking about here. This is some pretty amazing stuff that our Father, our Creator, is also our Redeemer. There is no other faith that can approach that. All this stuff, sure, don't, don't feel like you have to, you know, we're not meant to understand every detail of every bit of it, but this is what's important. How does it relate to us? What does it mean to us? How do we relate to our Father in heaven? We have a Father who carries us as a man carries his son. 
some of the things he carries us through. Suffering is the consequences of sin. We're suffering the consequences of sin right out of the gate before we even do anything. We've already got a problem. We're born with a problem. And that continues to reverberate through our society, through our churches. And of course, there's our own personal deliberate rebellion. We know better, and yet sometimes we just can't help it. Our own doubt, our questioning. You know, there's my absolute favorite movie. It's called A Beautiful Mind. It has to do with mental illness and literally like seeing and hearing things that aren't there to the point where it just destroys your mental health. After every method of treatment that could possibly be tried, they just kind of gave up and I said, we, we just can't, we can't help you. There's nothing left to do. But for some reason, this guy got better. And they tried to, this was based on a true story, by the way. And someone asked him, well, they said, it seemed like you're a lot better these days. What, do you, what about the voices? And what, what, are you, what are you doing about that? He says, I choose not to listen to them any longer. Doesn't mean they've gone away, but I choose not to listen. Just like we choose to love, we choose to forgive, we choose to be Christ-like over and over again every day if we're going to be any kind of successful at it. When doubt comes along, you choose not to listen to it. Emotions, our hearts are unstable. We've heard that many times, who can know the heart? It's a mess. We have that from Jeremiah. So we've got quite a stew cooking up here, and it's amazing. We, we can put one foot in front of the other when you look at this sometimes, right? So that's why we need our Father's help, our Father's guidance. That's why we need to know that we're carried as a man carries his son. Back to what we're talking about in Deuteronomy again, the promised land, the land of milk and honey. This is where it's all going to happen. And yet, you would not go up but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. And you murmured in your tents and said, because the Lord hated us, he's brought us out of the land of Egypt to give us in the land of Amorites to destroy us. You would not go up but rebelled against the command of your Lord your God. There's that personal rebellion. Well, how did that turn out for him? Not so well. You murmured in your tents and said, because the Lord hated us, he's brought us out of the land of Egypt to destroy us. Really? Let me tell you, folks, if you wanted to destroy you, you'd be gone. And I'm pretty sure that he wouldn't drag it out. I mean, see how far their concept of God had fallen. Now, he's basically like, they're portraying him like the worst of them. He not only wants to wipe him out, he wants to make him suffer for us and drag it out for a while. Bring you all that way, and then do you in. That's how warped, see all this... A little bit starts at a time. Next thing you know, the group think gets going, and it's a disaster. They're all listening to each other instead of listening to God, and none of them know what they're talking about. Again, verses 32 and 33, Yet in spite of this word, you do not believe the Lord your God, who went before you in the way to seek you out a place to pitch your tents, in fire by night and in the cloud by day, to show you by what way you should go, guiding you where to go, guiding you what to do. Avoid the disasters. Avoid the dangers. But their problem was they didn't believe him. Isn't that always the problem? They chose to listen to the voice of doubt, and it got stronger and stronger and stronger until they were a complete mess. And they blew their huge opportunity. And they suffered for it because they didn't believe it. Don't think that won't happen to you. And the Lord heard your words and was angered, and he swore not one of these men of this evil generation shall see the good land that I swore to give to your fathers, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. He shall see it, and to him and to his children I will give the land on which he has trodden. Why? Because he has wholly followed the Lord. Because he was all in. Went over there and said, look at this. This place is gorgeous. Grapes the size of your head. Everything we could possibly need here. It's beautiful. A man can really settle in here. Got some big guys over there, but I'm sure that's going to be no problem. But they didn't want to hear that. No, we're afraid. We don't want to go in there. God's just setting us up. Caleb's saying, what's wrong with you people? This is the moment. Didn't God say he would do this? I don't care how many of them there are. I don't care how big they are. I don't care how mean they are. Let's go get them. 
No, we're afraid. Even with me, Moses, the Lord was angry on your account and said, you also shall not go in there. Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall enter. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. If you believe what God has to say, if you're willing to trust him with the outcome, you'll have success. With David and Solomon in 2 Samuel, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Again, there's the holy God promising, I'm going to take care of your kid. I'm going to keep this going. I'm going to be his father as well. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, like the shepherd with that stick, right? With the stripes of the sons of men, but my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. This is the problem when we don't believe what our father has to say, when we're not willing to just put our hand in his and walk along. Jeremiah 17 tells us, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He's like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. So your life kind of looks like that. When you don't want to listen, when you don't want to believe, when you don't want to trust, when you let that voice in that says, no, 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 you, you can't. Way back, when that voice said, are you sure that's what God said? It's kind of where all that started, isn't it? Fortunately for us, as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Psalm 103. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. He's like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green. And is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. So maybe your life looks a little more like this spiritually. There are still problems. But let's not give those problems ammunition to make it worse. Seek God again because he will revive us when we seek him anew. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, all the remnant of the house of Israel, who have been born by me from before your birth, carried from the womb. We hear a lot about this lately, and I just want to say one thing. It was bad enough when it seemed like the general misunderstanding that led to so many abortions was people's misunderstanding about what life really is. But with the information they have now, and the way it's been brought to such an extreme, it, it's scarier than ever that they understand perfectly well that there's someone in there. They just want permission to do it anyway. Now, here's a verse that's great for people like me. Even to your old age, I am he, and to gray hairs, I will carry you. It's not like God's going to get sick of us or bored with us or give up on us or move on to somebody else. We're the one that rejects him. He doesn't reject us. As he's promised, I have made and I will bear, I will carry and will save. And Isaiah again, but now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We're all the work of your hand. This is how intimately God knows us. The work of his fingers. So that being the case, shouldn't we do what Ephesians says and be imitators of God as beloved children? All you've got to do is look in the Bible and look at the life of Jesus, and you know how to live. And the thing about that that's really great is what Psalm 127 says, like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. God wants to take you and shoot you out there to do something big, something important, something significant. It might not even seem like a big deal to you, but if you're trying to be Christ-like and you're listening and you're always ready and you believe what God has to say to you, he's going to do stuff with you because now you're out of the way. He's saying, shoot me out there, I'm ready. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Have I not commanded you? I haven't suggested it. I'm God. I've given you an order, so do it. Couldn't be more direct. But this is one of the hardest things for us to do, isn't it? It's hard for us not to be frightened. It's hard for us to not to doubt. It's hard for us not to wonder if we're going to make it through, if things are going to happen the way we hope, or bad things won't happen the way we think they might. We're unstable. He says, you'll be stable if you listen to me and pay attention to what I'm doing. 
do what I tell you. What I want you to do, I want you to trust God to carry you as he always has and he always will. Break after brick, God is building his temple. Break after brick, he is making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his people as the stones, he is building a place.